Good morning. I'm glad you're able to devote some time to worship this morning. And I want to welcome to you, you to this digital space or, or whatever this is. Uh, I do have a few announcements. I want to share with you a story out of scripture. Uh, and I should note that I am not in the place where I usually preach from, uh, at least for the, this, uh, these, whatever these are. Uh, I am sitting at my desk as I was up and about a lot this week camping and uh, it, it's a good my foot. It's just kind of get, getting to be a bit of a hassle. So I'm, I'm going to sit right now. But um, the announcements for this Sunday. Uh, next Sunday, we'll be having a meal after worship, uh, a meal of Thanksgiving uh, for the years of service. Uh, Deb Brockling, our secretary, has given to the church, celebrating as well. Uh, Lisa Conrad is going to be uh, serving as the secretary going forward. And, and I've been joking with Deb for years now, it's not much of a joke, that um, I, I, she runs the church. I happen to say a few words on Sunday, but uh, that is so very true. And so we have much to be thankful for, for all that she has done for the good of this church and this community. So uh, I hope you can join us in, in, in this meal if you are here in the area, obviously, or if you want to drive in. Um, I invite everyone who's coming to please bring a side if you are able, and I'll be smoking some pork loins this week, and they will be tasty. Uh, I don't think there are any other announcements we need to make right now. And so uh, the reading this day comes from Exodus. As we continue our sort of our stories from B BBS, this month of uh, June, we're telling some of the stories, the stories we are taught as children, these VBS type stories. And we're coming back to them again with sort of adult eyes and seeing uh, there's a lot of the depths that are there that we might have missed when we were a bit shorter. So this is Exodus 16. The whole congregation of the Israelites set out from Elam, and Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained, murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and shall gather enough for that day. And that way I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord your, bro your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that we utter against you, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. The house of Israel, skipping ahead to the end of the chapter, the house of Israel called it what they ate, manna. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations in order that they may see the food with which they were fed in the wilderness when you were brought out of the land of Egypt. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. As I was camping this week, uh, we, we put, didn't put the fly on the tent. Uh, and, and it's a mesh top to the tent. And so when I woke up in the morning, I looked up, I woke up and looked up onto a, a canopy of tree of green tree leaves and, and peeking through the green leaves were the blue, clear blue morning sky. It was, it was striking. It's a pretty good look, uh, thing to grow up to or uh, wake up to. And, and it's a kind of innocuous sentence for me to say I woke up to uh, the green leaves and the blue sky. We don't notice anything weird about that. Yet, if I took someone from 300 years ago in Japan and, and I, I camped with them and I invited them to describe the same scene that they woke up to, uh, they would have used the same word for the green leaf and the blue sky. 300 years ago in the Japanese language, the color for blue was also the color for green. I, 
it's not just in Japan that this is the case. It was also uh, from a few centuries ago in Chinese languages and in Welsh languages as well. Uh, a group of linguists, uh, scientists who study language, st had started poking around at the history of the words of, for color that we have, uh, the words that we take for granted. You see, if you look into the history of, of languages, the history of words, some cultures and languages have fewer words, and they combine what we separate. Like it, it's an interesting, like every, every language has a word for uh, light and dark, and then the next word they develop is the word for like red and then yellow. And then after that is a bit of a crapshoot, actually. What comes after that kind of varies by culture. So everyone has light, dark, or black, white, red, yellow, and then we uh, in Western cultures developed a blue and green. And Japan, they developed this like grew. How do you, what would you call blue and green combined? Uh, and, and then there are some cultures, some uh, languages, that further subdivided it. In um, Russian, Greek, and Turkish languages, they subdivide blue even further. So they have a distinct word for dark blues and a distinct word for, for light blue, uh, where, where we just have blue. It's fascinating to contemplate this, at least for me, as you as it shows us something that we already knew, we can only see what we are used to seeing. To see something else, to see something new, takes new experiences. We have to be around something. We have to experience something. And, and so if you take someone, for what, what the, these people studying the history of language found, is that if you took someone from um, one of the Japanese cultures, uh, Chinese cultures, that only had one word for blue, blue and green together, and, and you took them somewhere where they had a language, the language had a word for blue and a word for green, as they were around people who made that distinction, they began to see it themselves. But it took those, the new experience of being around people who, uh, who could see it for them to have that new experience, for them to be able to see it themselves. You can only see what people help you see, what you have experience to see. To be able to see new things, you have to be able to have new, new experiences. Today we read another of these seemingly simple stories of scripture, uh, this moment when the Hebrew people are going from, uh, they're on this journey from being slaves in Egypt and they're going across and they're heading towards the promised land. And, and along this way, um, they are fed by manna. And, and God tells them there will be manna, and that's what they eat. And uh, great, right? Simple story. Right? They, they, God provides. They get to make their journey, and this is good. Well, there's, there's a bit more to it. We begin by understanding how much the Hebrew people needed to learn. Like, they had been slaves all of their lives. They had been robbed of the opportunities to grow up the opportunities to learn to fend for themselves, the opportunities to make decisions and to do what needed to be done. And, and so they, they didn't know how to, to do this. And so they're going into the wilderness. And, and wilderness is, in some ways, the word wilderness is anything that is wild to us, anything that is outside of our usual expectations, anything that is different than what we are comfortable with. And, and so the wilderness does not have to be in the woods necess necessarily. In, in this case, the wilderness is not in the woods for them. They're going in this sort of desert, more, more desert type of situation. But uh, they are going into a land that they are not familiar with at all. It would have been a massive shock going from building each day. Like that's what their job was. They got up every day and they built and then they had food provided for them and then they slept. And then they did it again. They, they were people, they were slaves, they were used to build. And so now they are waking up and their job is to learn how to live on the land. Their job is to take responsibility for themselves and their families and to learn to grow up, so to speak. And they have to do this until they cease to be former Egyptian slaves and they 
who happen to be in the wilderness, and they are going to do it until they become God's people who have learned to live off the land according to what God has, has taught them. And, and this is going to, it takes a while for them to make that dramatic of a transformation. They've had a lifetime of being slaves. Now they're, it's going to take decades for them to learn uh, how to not be slaves and how to learn and see and, and live a new way. So we read at this point when they've just entered the wilderness, when the, the bread that they have made from Egypt is, is starting to peter out. Like we read two and a half months after they had left Egypt. So all the bread that they made to get, keep them going, uh, all the easy stuff for them to scavenge is, is gone. Like now they get to this point where they're looking out across the land and, they're, and they're, they don't see a way that they're going to eat. Like they don't know how to live off of the land. And they, so they start um, murmuring. They start murmuring. No one speaks up at first and makes a big deal of it, but the, the crowd of all these people starts to, to murmur. And if you've ever been in a situation where you've been in a large crowd where uh, you're waiting in line to get in and there starts to be a concern, is everyone going to get in? Or you're uh, waiting for seats at a movie and... Uh, are there going to be enough tickets? Say, or you're trying to check out and they start to be questionable. Is there going to be enough to go around? Like that sense of murmuring in the crowd, you've experienced that. It's that moment when fears start to kind of percolate. People start to worry. And fear is a contagious thing. It starts moving between people. And then, and then uh, after the murmuring has gone on for a while, some people uh, start to speak up. This is the Back to Egypt committee. They start to speak up. If only we could go back to Egypt. We'll go back to Egypt. They fed us well back there. No, they didn't. They didn't feed slaves well back in Egypt. They fed them, but they didn't feed them well. But this is part of the Back to Egypt committee's job. Like, the Back to Egypt committee is the group of people in any crowd, any group of people, who looks back and says, wasn't it great in the good old days? This is maybe another name for the committee. The Back to Egypt Committee, you can also call it the Good Old Committee, Good Old Days Committee, or Why Don't We Just Go Back Committee, or Why Don't We Just Go Back? It worked for us, right? We worked back then. And looking back, there's always rosy glasses. It's always, uh, it always looks better in retrospect. But that's what's happening here. Like the, the people are they're getting hungry, and there's some murmuring, and the Back to Egypt Committee forms and starts to push into Prague and say, well, we should just go back to Egypt. I mean, at least we would die well fed. Let's not, let's not die miserable out here. Right? Um, what's happening in this moment, and this is why it's kind of a crucial moment in, what's, in this whole story, this whole like moment as, this Jew, as the Hebrew people are, are learning and, and they're heading out and, and they're going to transform you know, over time into becoming God's, becoming, living into their call as God's people. Uh, this is the moment when they're grappling with scarcity. This is the moment when the fear, like the fear that they're murmuring about, the fear that's driving people to say, let's go back to Egypt. The fear is that uh, they're not going to have enough. There's a book on scarcity called um, Scarcity, Why Having little, So Little Means So Much. It's written by a book named Shafir. And he writes about the impact that scarcity has on our ability to function. Whether that scarcity is of time or money or food or whatever resource it is that we're scarce on. We can have all the money in the world, but be, be in a scarcity of time, and it will impact us in the same way. Right? If we have a scarcity, what we end up doing is focusing on that thing that we don't have enough of, and we start obsessing about it. Like I remember... Um, when at one of the most time scarce times in my life, I, a moment in college, when I had a planner and I was planning every minute of my day down to 15 minute increments because I was so scarce on, on time just to get things done. I just needed more time. So I was, I was obsessing about that thing that I needed more of. And so whether it's time or whatever it is, that hyper focus on whatever it is that we're short on, imposes a tax on our ability to think and to process and to imagine and, and to innovate like our ability to be flexible when we're in a situation of scarcity just goes away 
and, and they can quantify this. The, you, if the, uh, it's in this book if you want to get into the details of it, but you can quantify that we take about a 13 to 14 point IQ hit when, when we're in a situation of scarcity, when scarcity starts to act on us. And 14 points, like 100 points, 100 is an average IQ, 80 is you qualify for a special education resources, right? And so a 14 point difference in, uh, in IQ, that's really significant. And, and so, and I, and I think this is something we have probably seen in our lives. I know I've seen it in my life. When I am under pressure and I am under tension and scarcity and I don't have enough time or I don't have enough money or in the, the say in the, uh, what's happening in this, this moment in the Hebrew people's lives, they don't have enough food. Um, it's not a moment when you're trying new things. It's a moment when you're doing the things you've always done, but doing them and trying even harder because, you know, this is really just not the time to try something new because if you try something new and it doesn't work, then, oh, my Lord, things are just going to fall apart, right? If I, th when we're in a position of scarcity, that's not the time when we are, are flexible. That's not the time when we are able to, to innovate. And, and, and it's like, yeah, it's the moment when we get scared and afraid and we go back to what's worked in the past. And so this is a, a key moment. If the Hebrew people are going to be transformed over time to live this new way of life, to transform from former slaves into God's people living on the land and God's abundance. If they're going to learn how this is going to work, the first thing they need is to know that if they try this new thing, that they are going to have enough to eat. Because if they don't think they're going to have enough to eat, that's going to be the only thing they're going to think about. And so they need to know that doing these new things will not lead to the, their starvation. They're not going to have to worry about whether their children are going to have enough to, to put on, the, on their plates. Uh, that learning and experimenting is not going to risk whether they will survive. And so the first lesson right here, this is the first lesson that, that God gives the, the people as they enter the wilderness. This first lesson is before the Ten Commandments, it's before anything else, is that when you're following in God's way, there will be enough to eat. And, and that's what the, the abundance that God points out here is the abundance of, of this plant, the tamarisk plant. The tamarisk plant has this kind of like nectar, this fluid that, uh, without getting into all the details of how this works, if you find the tamarisk plant in the desert, uh, in arid lands, it, in the morning there will be this whitish, uh, yellowish, uh, solid substance it, it's this like nectar from the plant that has solidified overnight and if it and then the heat of the day it will melt away again but um you can take it and you can eat it you can still do it today and so there this is the way that they could get the food to eat that they needed eat, eat of this plant and also uh in, it's in the middle of this chapter exodus 16 it, uh, the word from god is that there will be quail that will fall from the sky and again this is natural this is what happens um when where they were at was a, a, a route of um, immigration, not immigration, it's when birds get to there's a flock and they fly together, uh, when, when the um, a migration route. The quail, they were going through a standard migration route for these birds. And it did happen that sometimes the quail got exhausted and just fell out of the sky. It wasn't common, it didn't happen all the time, but it did happen. And so for the Hebrew people to know that, uh, watch for this plant. You, if you go to this plant, you will have something to eat in the morning. And if quails start falling out of the sky, you grab them and eat them. And they'll, they'll, they'll be safe to eat. Like This is an important moment for the Hebrew people because up till now, when they've seen God at work, it's been the, the plagues back in Egypt convincing Pharaoh to let them know these big, supernatural, amazing, huge events. And like this, this is learning. This is one of these first lessons God gives. This first lesson is that there will be an abundance, and the abundance is what God will help you see. And it's not something supernatural or weird. It, it, you can to learn to see God in, in the entirely natural and the right in front of you. That, that was something they needed to know. And, and so they, they had enough to eat, and the murmuring fades, and, and now they can start learning what else they need to know. And, and so they, they're able to gather this food. And, and it's not just the lesson that God will provide, 
Like you just look at the way that God provides. To get what God provides in this, you have to get up and go do it. Like every morning, you have to get up, go out, and gather it. Like that, this is a profoundly important thing to know. Like it, God's abundance does not mean that we just sit on a, our laurels and do nothing. Uh, God's abundance is there to go and to get. So you have to get up and go and, and go and get it. And, and so get what you need for that day. And, and if you get too much, you're not going to get ahead because it will rot. It will just melt away in the heat of the sun. And if you get too much, what you're doing is forcing your neighbor to go further away to get what he or she needs. So you're not actually helping yourself. You're hurting your neighbor. And so this is just like really good basic things for the people to know. You have to get up every day and do the daily work <coughs> so that you will have something to eat. And if you, there are certain ways of working that will be damaging to your neighbors. And then the next part of it that uh, is, is wrapped up in the instructions around manna is gather extra on the sixth day so that you can take the seventh day off. Take the seventh day, the Sabbath day, to rest. God worked six days in creating all that is, and on the seventh day, God rested. God didn't need to rest, but God created rest and set that time aside as sacred, as holy. And we are made in the image of God, and so... We need rest as well. And this would be hard to know, hard to hear for uh, slaves, because I'm not thinking that the slaves got a day off a week. Um, I'm thinking that they were worked pretty, mu pretty hard pretty much every day. And for, for them to hear that their value was not in their labor, their value was not in how much they could work, their value was in who they were, and, and now here's how you should live as God's people, which involves taking a day to rest. That's all true today. That is all true for our lives today. As God's people, we are meant to find these rhythms of work and of rest, daily work that sees God's abundance in the world around us, work that pro provides enough for our families without making it harder for other families to have enough, work that pauses one day a week so that we might have the rest that we need, the time of joy, time with family, time to worship, time just not to work. Uh, and then if we don't learn these lessons that what results stinks, like that's what we read. Those who tried to gather too much, what they gathered, it rotted, it stank. And, and it might not be as obvious today, but it is still true that those who gather so much that they fall into the lie that they don't need anyone else, they don't need anyone because they have all this stuff, that's, that's a way of life that frankly stinks. It's a way of life that costs the person who gathers all that stuff and it costs the neighbors around who you know, there's enough for everyone's need but there's really there's a problem if, if greed, greed starts driving uh, how people work now i wish i could say that everyone can experience the abundance that we're talking about here but i would be lying if i did i mean just looking at the the, the these hebrew people the hebrew people they were coming out the, the reason that they didn't know of god's abundance is because they had been stuck as slaves in uh, Egypt. They had been stuck living in a way of life that detached them from God's abundance. And, and so they had a life that was, was hard. And uh, they had to learn, again, learn for themselves uh, what it meant, what it means to live in God's abundance. And that is still true today. There are people who need to experience uh, God's abundance. And, and so there are ways that we as a church can be involved in that. I must say that I, I look, as I look across the Methodist, what the Methodist Church has done, it is with some pride on my part, on our part, that we can point to the over 100 Methodist colleges and universities around the United States that exist for the purpose of making sure that people can be educated and, and receive what they need so that they can make a living, that, that education that is part of lives today. That is a very good thing. It is a gift to this nation and its people that the Methodist Church has founded so many universities and colleges all, all over. Right? It is also, we can also point at the Methodist hospitals. There are Methodist hospitals all over this country, including, for example, the Houston Methodist Hospital, one of the largest in the nation. 
that began in 1919 when the Methodist Church needed to respond to the uh, Spanish flu epidemic, pandemic, and said, well, what are we going to do in response to this? We're going to build a hospital so that everyone in this area will have what they need, will have uh, God's abundance, will have the doctors and the nurses to take care of them, which is just profound and moving. It is a very Methodist response to the problems in our culture to build schools, to build hospitals, to support efforts uh, that support families and, and the people who work to make sure that families can eat. It's back in uh, 1908 that the Methodist Church put together a statement that then was adopted by uh, the, the Na National Council of Churches across the nation that drove uh, changes in American culture that we are still benefiting from today. And so here is the statement that was put together. The Methodist Church is working for the equal rights and complete justice for all men in all stations of life, for the principles of conciliation and arbitration and industrial dissensions, for the protection of the worker from dangerous machinery, occupational diseases, injuries, and mortality, for the abolition of child labor, for the regulation of the conditions of labor labor for women as shall safeguard the physical and moral health of the community for the suppression of the sweating system those sweatshops as we call them today for the gradual and reasonable reduction of the hours of labor to the lowest practical point with work for all and for that degree of le leisure for all which is the condition of the highest human life for our release from employment one day in seven for a living wage in every industry for the highest wage that each industry can afford and the most equitable dis division of the products of industry that can ultimately be devised. For the recognition of the golden rule in the mind of Christ as the supreme law of society and the sure remedy for all social ills. I, I read that and like that's part of the, the things that have changed in America were because Methodists looked around and having been shaped by following Jesus, could articulate like we think this is how people should be able to live and so all of these efforts schools and hospitals and labor reform are all rooted in being a people that can see such a way of life as possible a people that knows the the lessons of the wilderness that if people are willing to get out there and work every day that if people are willing to work in a way that respects the needs of their neighbors that this should lead to an abundant life for all this is the lesson that the Hebrew people, this is the first lesson they learned as they went into the wilderness so that they would not be murmuring in fear and, and worried about whether they would be able to feed their families. And so again, going back to those linguists studying uh, the nature of language, like you can only see what you have been helped to see. Like the way that like if, if you needed to learn how to tell the difference between blue and green, and you're a Japanese person 300 years ago, you went somewhere where they knew the difference, and then you would experience the difference, and then you could live that. Then you could say, ah, oh, that's blue and, and that's green, and you'd be able to describe a campsite scene with green leaves and a, and a blue sky. And, and we, as followers of Jesus, have this same need. We need to be transformed so that we can see uh, what an abundant mana-based mana approach to life looks like and I, I hope that I pray that we can continue to do that as a people come together as followers of Jesus come together at the communion table come together and hear again and again and again that at the communion table there is always enough that everyone is always welcome and, and there is an abundance there and, and then gathered at that table we hear God's call to love our neighbor such that we can become like the Hebrew people who learned to let go of murmuring, learned to let go of fear, learned to let go of scarcity, and, and be able to instead trust that God will provide. There will be enough in as much as we share what, what is needed, and that out of that abundance we can innovate and change and grow and learn and become the church and the people that God calls us to be for our good and for the good of our community and the good of our nation. Let us pray. Lord, help us to learn to see with the Hebrew people, seeing your gifts in the abundance of nature, 
direct us, Lord, help us to see the ways that we can, that we can be involved to free and to help those who do not experience abundance today. Break the heart of those who by their actions cause others to suffer. Do all of, we pray for all these things in the name of you, our, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ be with you this day and always.